this is Pastor Rick, and I want to welcome you to the Sunday Forum here at Emmanuel Lutheran Church on Sunday, July the 18th. We're glad that you joined us. Our topic for this morning is Ephesus, the city and the book. Of course, the book is Ephesians. And here's going to be the challenge this morning. I'm going to challenge you sometime this week to read through the book of Ephesians all the way through. There are six chapters. And why is that challenge so important? Uh, because six of the next seven weeks, we're reading Ephesians on every Sunday. We started last week with chapter one, this week chapter two. We're going to move all the way through all six chapters of Ephesians. And so if you watch the Sunday Forum uh, today and you go back and read Ephesians, you will be well prepared for worship in the coming weeks. So we first want to talk about the city so you have some context uh, in reading the book. As you can see, it's a major uh, city in Turkey at that time, in the biblical times, of Asia Minor. And you can see it's on the western coast, but here you can see here's Italy, Greece, and all this commerce you can see uh, would go from Greece and Italy to Asia Minor, then through Ephesus, so major trading um, hub in Asia Minor. Now here's four main characteristics of the city that I want you to remember as you read the book this week. And the first is it was one of the biggest cities in Asia Minor, in, uh, at the time, today Turkey, one of the largest and most thriving cities of the Roman Empire at the time of the Apostle Paul, which is why Paul goes there on his second missionary journey. Uh, there were prominent Jewish synagogues there, large town, religious town. Paul said this is the perfect place to preach the gospel. The second is it had this famous temple, the temple uh, to Diana that was more uh, under the Greeks, but that Artemis uh, became uh, known. This was a massive, massive temple, 425 feet long, 220 feet high, 127 pillars. We don't can't see much of that today, although some of the pillars are in the British Museum in London. But at the time, it was one of the seven wonders of the world. One of the seven wonders of the world, like with the Babylonian gardens. And so people would come then to Ephesus to see this magnificent uh, temple, to worship, to get statuary. Uh, it was a major tourist hub, has always been a major tourist hub in the ancient world and today. Another thing that was impressive about the town in the time of Paul is it had an amphitheater that could seat 50,000 people. I mean, that's like a modern football stadium today. But at the, in the day, you could imagine in Paul's day how impressive that was. Amphitheater, 50,000 people. And this city really contained a thriving Christian community, especially after Paul's second missionary journey there. So here you see a picture from the Bible Project, and we're going to show the Bible Project later and its summary of Ephesians. But there you see the library, the amphitheater, and here is the temple behind me with the Christian uh, community thriving and growing in Ephesus. In fact, Timothy becomes one of the first pastors uh, of this town, and he becomes one of his first bishops because the community grew and grew and grew. So here's another uh, picture. You can see how impressive this is of the amphitheater set within this uh, mountain, uh, a major focal point of the city. And this is special too. When you walk, um, when you walk into this amphitheater, you know that it wasn't just all theater productions and drama, that often this is where the Christians faced some early persecution. And it's imagined that Paul had to fight some wild beasts, some lions, here in this amphitheater because he was regularly imprisoned here in Ephesus within his two-year stay there. But also you can see here, the seating is impressive, the views, but what happened there was often quite hor horrific. Now here again, one of the seven Wonders of the world, this temple of Artemis. You can see this was the early picture of Diana. Uh, the temple was then destroyed and then rebuilt. And Artemis becomes uh, this goddess of fertility and the moon and the hunt and became the local 
goddess who really helped build up the prosperity of the city of Ephesians. And here you get a sense, get a sense of, of the temple and how impressive it really was. So we want to take a look now at Paul and this book of the, to the Ephesians. Some other things you should know about the background before you watch this video. Uh, again, Paul visited Ephesus, stayed there two uh, years, but it was on his second missionary uh, journey. Again, he probably faced wild beasts in that amphitheater. Imagine that. Also, 1 Corinthians was written from this town and possibly also the Gospel of John. Priscilla and Aquila discipled Apollos here in Ephesus. And in Revelation, we remember uh, here they talked about you lost your first love. That's in Revelation chapter 2. And finally, it's thought that Mary, the mother of Jesus, after his death, went to Ephesus and retired there. That's a lot of background in the church. And so now we want to watch together this summary of the book of Ephesians. So you'll be ready for the readings out of Ephesians over the next coming five and six weeks. Let's watch the video right now. Paul's letter to the Ephesians. The story of how Paul came to the city of Ephesus is really interesting. You can go read about it in Acts chapter 19. Ephesus was a huge city. It was the epicenter of worship for most of the Greek and Roman gods. And for over two years, Paul had a really effective missionary presence there, and lots of people became followers of Jesus. Years later, after being imprisoned by the Romans, Paul wrote this letter. The movement of thought in the letter divides into two really clear halves. In the first half, Paul is exploring the story of the gospel, how all history came to its climax in Jesus and in his creation of this multi-ethnic community of his followers. The second half of the letter is linked to the first by the word, therefore. And here Paul explores how the gospel story should affect how we live every part of our life story, personally, in our neighborhoods and communities, and in our families. So let's dive in and we can see how Paul develops all of this. Chapter 1 opens with a beautiful Jewish style poem where Paul praises God the Father for the amazing things that he has done in Christ Jesus. From eternity past, the Father has purpose to choose and bless a covenant people. And think here, the family of Abraham and Genesis chapter 12 verses 1 through 3. And through Jesus now, anyone can be adopted into that family. Jesus' death covers our worst sins, our worst failures, and in Jesus we find God's grace. In fact, Paul says, that grace has opened up a whole new way for us to understand every part of our lives. He says in chapter 1 verse 10 that God's purpose was to unify all things in heaven and on earth under Christ, which is a title that means Messiah. God's plan was always to have a huge family of restored human beings who are unified in Jesus the Messiah. This divine purpose became clear, Paul says, when we were first made into that family. And here he's referring to ethnic Jews in the family of Abraham. But then Paul talks about how you, and here he means non-Jews, you all heard about Jesus and the salvation through him. And you were also brought into this family by the work of the Holy Spirit. And so here he's referring to the events told in the stories of Acts about how God's Spirit brought together Jew and non-Jew into one family in Jesus. It's just like God promised to Abraham long ago. Notice also how in this poem, Paul begins by talking about God the Father, but then about Jesus the Son, and then he here the end about the Spirit. All three work together as Paul tells the story of the gospel. It's really cool. After the poem, Paul responds with a prayer. He prays that these followers of Jesus would not just know about but personally experience the power of the gospel, that they would be energized by the same power that raised Jesus from the dead and placed him as the exalted head of the whole world. Now in chapter 2, Paul goes back and he elaborates on some key ideas from the poem in chapter 1, especially God's grace and this new multi-ethnic family of Jesus. He begins by retelling the story of how these non-Jewish Christians came to know Jesus. Before hearing about Jesus, they were physically alive, but they were spiritually dead. They were trapped in a purposeless life of selfishness and sin, and they were deceived by dark spiritual forces of evil. But amazingly, 
God, in his great love and mercy, he saved them, he forgave all of their sins, and he joined their lives to Jesus' resurrection life, and he's brought them back to life too. And so now, having been created as new human beings through Jesus, they have the joy of discovering all of the new calling and purposes and tasks that God has set before them. Not only have they been shown God's grace, they've also been invited into a new family. Before hearing about Jesus, these non-Jewish people, they were not just cut off from God, they were cut off from his covenant people, the family of Abraham. And for a really practical reason, the commands of the Sinai covenant, they formed like a boundary line around the family. They were like a barrier that kept most non-Jewish people away. But in Jesus, the laws of the Torah have been fulfilled and the barrier is removed. The two ethnic groups have become, as Paul puts it, a new unified humanity that can live together in peace. So Paul goes on in chapter 3 to marvel at the unique role that he got to have in spreading this good news to non-Jewish people. And even though he's in prison, he's thanking God for the chance he's had to see this covenant family grow so huge. So Paul closes the first half of the letter with another prayer. This This time, he prays that Jesus' followers would be strengthened by God's Spirit to simply grasp and comprehend the love that Christ has for his people. The second half of the letter begins with Paul shifting gears, and he starts challenging the reader to respond to the gospel story by how they live their own life story. So he starts in chapter 4 with just the everyday life of the church. The church is a big family with lots of different kinds of people, but he emphasizes that they are one. And one is a key word in this chapter. They are one body that's unified by one spirit. They have one Lord with one faith. They have one baptism. They believe in one God. That's a lot of unity. However, Paul says unity is not the same thing as uniformity. He goes on to explore how Jesus' new family can consists of lots of very, very different kinds of people, but they're all empowered by the one Holy Spirit, each using their unique talents and passions to serve and to love each other and to build up the church. And here he uses two really cool metaphors. One is building up the church as a new temple, and the second is that they are all becoming a new humanity with Jesus as the head. And this new humanity is a metaphor he's going to then run with for the next couple chapters. Paul challenges every Christian to take off their old humanity, like a set of old clothes, and to put on their new humanity in which the image of God is being restored. And he then goes on into this long section where he compares this new and old humanity. So instead of lying, new humans speak truth. Instead of harboring anger, they peacefully resolve their conflicts. Instead of stealing, new humans are generous. Instead of gossiping, they encourage people with their words. Instead of getting revenge, new humans forgive. Instead of gratifying every sexual impulse, new humans cultivate self-control of their bodily desires. Instead of getting drunk, new humans come under the influence of God's spirit. And he spells out what that influence looks like in four different ways. The first two have to do with singing, singing together, but also singing alone. And this is really interesting that the first thing that Paul thinks of about how the Spirit works in the lives of Jesus' people is singing and music. The third sign of the Spirit's influence is being thankful for everything. And the fourth is that the Spirit will compel Jesus' followers to put themselves underneath others and to elevate others as more important than themselves. And Paul actually expands on this fourth point by showing how it works in Christian marriage. So you have a wife who follows Jesus. She is called to respect and to allow her husband to become responsible for her. And the husband is called to love his wife and to use his responsibility to lay down his selfish agenda and to prioritize his wife's well-being above his own. And Paul says it's this kind of marriage that's actually reenacting the gospel story. The husband's actions mimic Jesus and his love and his self-sacrifice. The wife's actions mimic the church, which allows Jesus to love her and to make her new. Paul then applies the same idea to children and parents as well as slaves and masters. 
Paul closes out the letter by reminding these Christians of the reality of spiritual evil. These are beings and and forces that will try to undermine the unity of Jesus' people and to compromise their new humanity. And so Paul challenges them to stand firm and to put on this metaphorical set of body armor, which he describes in detail. And Paul has drawn all of these pieces of body armor from the book of Isaiah and how Isaiah depicted the messianic king. And so now, as the Messiah's follow we need to make the Messiah's attributes our own since we make up Jesus's body. Practically, I think Paul means for Christians to begin to form habits, proactively using prayer and the scriptures and our relationships with each other to help us grow and mature as followers of Jesus. And that's the letter to the Ephesians. Very powerful. It's where Paul summarizes the whole gospel story and how it should reshape every part of our life story.